angry to people preaching that God so loved the world he sent his only begotten son. I heard him preaching that he laid his hands on the cross and bled and died between two thieves so that we could have life. If all this is true, why should we fear him? How can we fear the Lord who gave his life for us? When I was old enough to read, I began to study the Word of God. I wanted to see what it meant to fear the Lord. And I found it finally in Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 13. And it says, The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. It's not to fear God. It's not to sit there with an umbrella hoping he doesn't drop a brick on you. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. And that's a pretty strong word. It doesn't say the fear of the Lord is to be indifferent towards evil, or to tolerate evil, or to embrace evil, or to coddle evil. It is to hate evil. To have an aversion to it. To not be able to stand it. That is the fear of the Lord. And the question that begs to be asked is why? Why is the fear of the Lord hatred of evil? Because evil is never satisfied. Because evil dulls the senses and it paralyzes the conscience. Evil consumes the soul from within. Evil leads to death. And the reason there is so much sin in America, in the house of God, in the church today, is that the church stopped hating evil. The reason that so many are confused in the house of God in this nation is that the church stopped hating evil. We have to embrace them. We have to tolerate them. It's okay. It could be worse. Man stopped hating evil. The children of God stopped hating evil. And they were no longer wise. And the word of God says God's people perish with lack of knowledge. For lack of God's wisdom, not lack of current events or lack of the news or lack of, of mathematics, they perish for the lack of knowledge of God's will. And God's will is for his children to hate evil. Righteousness needs to reign in the house of God. And the sad thing is, this isn't the first time that it's happened. We go back to the people of Israel and we see that at one point along the way, they stopped hating evil. And sometime later, there was a man named Elijah who had to come along. And Elijah, poor guy, he saw what was happening. He saw the road that Israel was headed towards. And he saw the final conclusion of it. Any man of God in this nation will see where the slope the church is headed on eventually leads. This is why so many are concerned for the house of God. Perhaps it's not that bad today. But two years from now, you'll see where we are. And five years later, you'll see where we are. Because it's a downward spiral. And it leads to hell. And in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah saw where the people of Israel, where, where the people of God were headed. And so Elijah, trying to do all he can, goes to Ahab. And apparently Elijah had a reputation. Because all men of God have a reputation. They're not well liked. They're not well received. Because what they have to say pierces to the heart of the matter. It goes to where you don't feel comfortable. It exposes things that you'd rather keep hidden. And so when Elijah goes before Ahab, Ahab goes, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? That was his question. Is that you, O troubler of Israel? Why can't you just be quiet? Why can't you just be satisfied with the status quo? Why can't you just let them live in spiritual mediocrity? Why do you trouble Israel? And in America today, there are preachers who still hold up the standard of truth. There are people who are still willing to, to put their lives and themselves and their reputation on the line and say that God requires righteousness and holiness. And many times, they get the same response from pastors and preachers and deacons like Elijah got from Ahab. Is that you, O troubler of America? Why can't you just let the people be? Because we see where this road leads. This is why we're here. Because we 
see where this world leads. We see where spiritual mediocrity will take the children of God. And it's not a happy place. And it's not a good place. And so Elijah saw no other choice. And he gathered all the people of Israel, but he also gathered the enemies, the nemesis, the prophets of Baal. And in verse 21 of 1 Kings 18, it says, And Elijah came to all the people, and he said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. That was it. Elijah had enough. It was the ultimatum. It was test time. If God is God, if the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And now the children of Israel had progressed so far down this path that it says, but the people answered him not a word. Scary, isn't it? That the people of God, those who had seen the miracles of God over and over and over again, had dipped into sin so much, had been clouded by evil so much, that when Elijah asked the question, who will you follow? Which path will you take? The people answered him not a word. They had no answer. And they'd seen the power of God. This evening, right here, you've heard of the power of God. You heard that he can still heal. You heard that he can still do miracles. You heard that he can still defy the logic of man. And still, some of you are uncertain which way you will choose. Whether it be the way of the world or the way of the cross. And the twain never shall meet as the same goes. Because they go in separate directions, they're diametrically opposed. If you choose the world, then do it. If you choose Christ, then do it. But you can't sit at the crossroads forever. Remember that. You can't sit at the crossroads forever. Each of us in this room, each of us in this nation, and in this world will have to choose. No one can stand on the sidelines and watch the game. We're all in it. Sooner or later, we choose. And then Elijah said to the people, I alone am not the prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets are 450 men. And this is where you start to see the character of Elijah. This is where you start to see what men of God are made of. When they start to walk in the authority of God. When they no longer fear for their flesh. I'm left alone. I alone am left the prophet of the Lord, he says. Baal's guys are 450. But see, he didn't consider that these men could bum rush him and kill him. He didn't consider that he couldn't take on 450 men. He knew that he could no longer stand by and see Israel going downhill. He knew that it was time to test it, to see what they would choose. And if they chose Baal, then fine, his hands were clean, he'd go his way, and Israel would go theirs. And it says, therefore, let them give us two bowls. Let them choose one bowl for themselves, cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bowl, and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. Amen? So all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. Now we see that throughout this entire discourse, the prophets of Baal were silent. Throughout Elijah's entire discourse, they didn't say anything. <coughs> because in their hearts, they knew their God was dead. In their hearts, they knew their God wouldn't answer. It wasn't the prophets of Baal that said, All right, bring it on. Let's see who answers. It was the people. It was those that were undecided. They said, It is well spoken. This is the acid test. Let's see who answers. And so now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bowl for yourselves and prepare it first, for you are many. Nice God. And call on the name of your God and put the fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it, and called on the name of Baal from morning, even till noon, saying, O oh, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. And they leaped about the altar which they had made. See, when men 
choose to make their own altars, when men choose to make their own gods in their own image, they can leap about the altar and they can cry aloud all day, but their God will not answer. There is only one God. Friends, there is only one God. I should have heard Amen. This is elementary. There is only one God. And he sent his son Jesus Christ to this earth to die for our sins. And then he rose again the third day. And he stands at the right hand of God and he is worthy of our worship and our praise. Amen? Amen. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them. The courage of this man. He's standing there mocking 450 guys who are lathered up with their own sweat because they've been praying and leaping about all day. And he says, cry aloud, for he isn't God. Either he's meditating, or he's busy, or he's on a journey, or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. He was making fun of these guys. But these guys weren't concerned about Elijah anymore. They knew that if their God didn't answer, they would lose the trust of the people. When the time comes that these strange gods must answer, and they're silent, the people will wake up. When the time comes that these strange doctrines that are brought about in the house of God are no longer fruitful, when it comes that they no longer apply and that people need to cling to God, otherwise they're going to drown, there has to be an Elijah. There has to be a man of God that says this is the path. You've walked the wrong path for a while, but the good path is still here. And God is still willing to embrace you as a child. And God is still willing to forgive you. And God is still willing to bestow salvation upon you. But you still choose. And it continues and it says, How? And cut themselves. As was their custom. With knives and lances. Until the blood gushed out of them. And we saw some of this a couple of years ago. Where men were so dedicated to their dead God. That they were willing to die. They got on a plane and they crashed it into a building, all for their strange God. They cut themselves and they bled. This is how deep their faith ran. And they were bleeding for a lie. And the God of the Bible simply asked, Son, bring me your heart. You don't have to cut yourself or whip yourself or beat yourself, you don't have to commit suicide. You don't have to do any of these things. The only thing I require of you is devotion and worship. The only thing I require of you is that you give me your heart. He's not asking for a lot. But we're so unwilling to give him just this little bet that he asks. While others, for false gods and dead gods, are willing to lay down their lives. Shame on us. Friends, shame on us that we're unwilling to get out of our house and go tell someone about Christ when these guys are strapping on bombs and walking into malls. Shame on us. We have the truth and we do nothing with it. Shame on us. And this country is afraid of, of nuclear weapons and it's afraid of exterior attacks. When God needs to judge a nation, all it takes is 18 guys and box cutters. That's all it took. It didn't take bombs. It didn't take nuclear weapons. It didn't take rockets. It took a bunch of guys and some box cutters. And God made his point that day. Without my protection, you are nothing. Because empires have crumbled. Empires that span half this globe crumbled overnight when God said no more. If we are strong, it's due to him. If we have peace, it's due to Him. If we have freedom, it's due to Him. It's all due to God. And if His children don't start acknowledging it, the time will come and we'll take it away. Because the first thing that God requires is that you have a thankful heart for the things that He's given you. That you have a thankful heart for the providence that He's bestowed upon you. And if you don't do it, it's going to be gone. I'm being mean tonight. I'm sorry. And it continues and it says, And it was so when midday was past that they prophesied until the 
the time of the offering for the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. And no one answered. And no one paid attention. The prophets of Baal prophesied. Today there's a lot of men who prophesy. And they prophesy peace and prosperity. And they prophesy good times for all until the end of the age. passage in Ezekiel that says, your prophets have prophesied falsely. They see false divinations. They prophesy peace to you and calamity is coming because it's not what man says, it's what you see with your own eyes that's happening in this country that will decide what God does in the future. For the flesh it may be good to hear someone thus says the Lord, you're all going to be alright. But if you see that the church is in sin, if you see that the church stopped being evil, you know that that man is full of loneliness. Even if it sounds good for the flesh. Because the prophets of Baal prophesied too. But it wasn't for any God, it was for their bellies. And it was to pump themselves up. Alright, one more slice and he's going to answer. Nothing happened. No one answered. Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. So all the people came near to him, and he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. What a wise, wise man Elijah was. First things always come first. If we want revival to come to the house of God, plus first we must repair the relationship with God. If we want God to accept our sacrifice, first and foremost we must repair the altar that has been broken down. And the altar has been broken down in the house of God because of sin and complacency, because of compromise. The altar has been broken down, and we need to rebuild it in order for God to say, I accept the sacrifice. Lip service is not enough. We talked about this last night. God wants action on our part. And the time is growing shorter each and every day. I'm not here because I like to drive a lot, or I like to be away from my family. I'm here because I know how short the time is. And I know that God's desire is still to reach out to His people and say, choose the right path now while you still have the time. That's it. That's the only reason I'm here. And Elijah took twelve stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. And he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seas of sea. And he put the wood in order, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood, and said, Fill four water pots with water, and pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. And I'm thinking by now the prophets of Baal will get pretty antsy. Because already Elijah knew that God was going to answer. And he wanted to do it in such a way where there would be no doubt in anybody's mind that it was God. See, he held himself to a higher standard than the prophets of Baal. It would have been enough for the prophets of Baal to kindle a fire under some dry meat and some dry rocks. But Elijah said, come on, that's, that's good stuff. That's it. Yeah, I, I hold myself to a higher standard because I know the power of my God. Bring some water in. And so, four water pots of water were poured on the birds a second time, so that was eight. And he said, do it a third time. So that was twelve. And they did it a third time. So the water ran all around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. Amen? Amen. Amen. You can't hold yourself to the standards of the world. If you do, you're already lost. Yeah. Yeah. God's standards are pure. What goes for the world shouldn't go for the church. What's okay with the world shouldn't be okay with the church. We have to hold ourselves to a higher standard in God and expect that God be faithful because we're holding to that higher standard. And it continues and it says, And it came to pass at the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, that I have done all these things at your word. And Elijah didn't go and find. Elijah wasn't just an angry man who wanted to get this over with. Let him know that everything I did, I did at your word. Let him know that all I did was be obedient to your voice. I knew how this thing would turn out from the moment I walked onto this field. I knew how this thing would turn out from the first time I went to visit Ahab and told him to get all the people together. Because you, you have spoken to me. We have to be certain of our faith. We have to know what God's will is for us. Each of us in his own right must
trust them what God's will is for their life. So that when it is complete, when we run the race, all we can say is, Lord, I did everything you told me. That was all Elijah was doing. He was being faithful to God's voice. He was fulfilling what God told him to do. And here's, I think, the most important verse of this entire passage. And he says, Hear me, O Lord. Hear me that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. God's desire remains unchanged. Throughout history, God's desire remains unchanged. That the people's hearts may be turned back to Him again. And He will go to extraordinary measures to cause this to happen. I hope you hear me on this. God will go to extraordinary measures to turn His people's hearts back to Him again. I heard a lot of people say God didn't allow the towers to fall. And who did? God is omnipotent, isn't He? He knows all that is to be and all that will come. Future, past, present, everything's the same to Him. He knew that this would happen and He allowed it. This is the measure to which God will go to turn His people's hearts back to Him again. And if the hearts don't turn, it will be worse. I hope you hear me on this. I'm not trying to scare you, but it's what the Word of God says. Over and over and over again. If my people don't heed the first warning, I am forced to send something worse their way. And the verse continues and it says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust and it lifted up the water that was in the trench. And the people couldn't doubt it anymore. And the people couldn't doubt it anymore. See, this was the miracle power of God. And when this happened, when the fire came down, they still had a choice. But see, when the fire comes down in this nation, we won't have a choice anymore. Then it will be too late. Because God now is sending Elijah throughout this country saying, repent. Right now, God is sending people throughout this land saying, choose the right path. And if you do, God will exceed your expectations. God exceeded the expectations of the Israelites. His standard was so much higher than the prophets of Baal. He said, water and dust and stones and everything. Because when God consumes, He consumes everything. Nothing is left whole when the fire of God comes. And it says, now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Amen? Amen. No longer undecided. No longer not knowing which way to choose. And I'm sure that the way of Baal was, was tempting, as is the way of the world today. For the flesh at least, it was very tempting. But when they were confronted with the power of God, they had no choice but to fall on their face and recognize the truth for what it was. The Lord is God. Amen? Amen. And Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Do not let one of them escape. So they seized them. And Elijah, this meek prophet, and I envision him as being, you know, a lowly man just doing his duty before God. This Elijah brought them down to the brook of Kishon and executed them there. And there's a lesson to be learned even from this. When you see sin spring up in the camp, be merciless with it. Don't coddle it. Don't tolerate it. Elijah knew that if he didn't get rid of the prophets of Baal, sooner or later they would rise up again. Sooner or later they would have problems because of them again. And so he took them all down to the brook of Kishon and he executed them there. The house of God must be sin free. This is an example for us today. If you see sin in the church, be merciless with it. Execute it on the spot. 
the truth. Otherwise, it will come back stronger. Otherwise, it will come back that much more determined to cause you to lose your way, to cause you to be undecided. See, because the devil doesn't particularly want you to go into the world. All he needs is for you to be undecided. And that's enough for him. If you're undecided, he's got you. If you don't know which path you're going to take, the way of the world or the way of the cross, he's already won. And to this day, God is still trying to turn the hearts of his people back to him. Amen. To this day, God is doing extraordinary things to say, hey, I'm still here. I'm still here. I'm still willing to do everything that I promised in my word. I'm still willing to fulfill my promises. I'm still willing to heal. I'm still willing to speak to you. But first, you must choose. Stop standing at the crossroads. First, you must choose. And once you've chosen, then you will see the power of God. Once you've chosen, you will see the move of God. And there won't be just two testimonies and three testimonies a night. The whole evening will be testimonies of how God works. Of the power of God that can change hearts, that can heal bodies. This is what we signed up for. This is the beauty of God and His Word. It's not just empty words that go and bounce off the walls. It's not just good music that we go home and we go home as empty as we came here. Amen. The Word of God is supposed to feed us. It's supposed to fill us. It's supposed to be consistent enough that it takes us through the hard times. The, prophecy, the, the, the promises of God must echo in our ears. Each time you see trials, each time you see turmoil, the promises of God must echo in your ear. I will be with you holding your hand. I will take you to the storm. Victory will be yours. All these things God has promised. And God is not a liar. God is not a liar. But he also promised another thing. That he will judge sin. Whether it be in the church or in the world, he will judge sin. And he will keep that promise as well. Because God is not a liar. We still have the time to choose our path. But if we stand on the crossroads long enough, Time will come when we will be able to choose it. Because being undecided is choosing after a certain extent and after a certain while. And woe to those who knew the way of truth but chose to reject.